We are fortunate to have Dr. Greg Susla provide our next lecture. Dr. Susla is currently the Associate Director of Medical Information at MedImmune. Greg received a pharmacy degree, his Bachelor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Connecticut and his Doctorate of Pharmacy from the University of Florida and completed a critical care pharmacy residency at the Ohio State University Hospital. He spent the majority of his career as the ICU pharmacist at the NIH. We hope you enjoy today's lecture. Good afternoon and welcome to today's lecture on continuous renal replacement therapy. Uh, this is a, a therapy typically used in critically ill patients in intensive care units. Uh, it, differs, it differs from intermittent dialysis that is typically used on an outpatient basis in people uh, in chronic renal failure. It's important to understand the various types of continuous renal replacement therapy, or CRRT as it's commonly known. Um, if you go back, it was a, a therapy first discovered in Germany in the 19, late 1970s, and at that time it was known as SCUF. And SCUF stood for Slow Continuous Ultrafiltration, and that was a form of renal replacement therapy that was mainly used for continuous volume removal in critically ill patients. That evolved over the next uh, four or five years to the early to mid-1980s to a therapy known as CAVH, or Continuous Arterial Venous Hemofiltration. And that was a modality that the, it was driven by the patient's blood pressure, where you had one catheter in a large artery, such as the femoral artery, and you had another catheter uh, located in the femoral vein for the re re return of fluids back to the patient. And that was known as CAVH, and again, that was used maintain primarily for fluid removal. As we progressed throughout the 80s, we added a countercurrent dialysis circuit, and so that became known as CAVHD. Uh, so now you had solute removal via convection and uh, diffusion. With the hazards of having large bore catheters in large arteries, such as the femoral artery, and, and in uh, large veins, such as the femoral vein, um, they wanted to get rid of, or wanted to uh, move to a less uh, invasive system. So we evolved to CVVH, or continuous venovenous hemofiltration, uh, where again it was continuous over 24 hours. Uh, the blood supply coming from the patient was no longer a large artery, but uh, a large vein, typically the femoral vein. Uh, it was returned back to the patient, in this case also through the femoral vein, and again hemofiltration was just for fluid removal. We then added countercurrent dialysis to increase the uh, efficacy of solute removal. And then in the last 10 years, we've actually moved to a new therapy called SLED, or Sustained Low Efficiency Dialysis. And this is kind of a mix of both a uh, continuous form of dialysis, but instead of being over 24 hours, it's um, in, uh, provided over 12 to 18 hours a day, making it somewhat more flexible for the patient uh, in the intensive care unit. The indications for renal replacement therapy is basically to remove excess fluid in a fluid overloaded patient who may be aneuric. Uh, the clinical need to administer fluid in someone in the ICU typically revolves around the administration of parenteral solution, so that could be parenteral, or nutrition solution, so that could be parenteral or enteral, where you may be administering one to two liters of uh, nutrition solution a day. Uh, the fluids associated with uh, antibiotic administration, uh, vasoactive substances such as, let's say, dopamine or norepinephrine, uh, blood products like Packard cells or platelets or something like that, and then other types of parenteral medications that the patients may need during their stay in the ICU, such that the amount of fluid that you're giving them, uh, the body is not able to keep up with the urine output that you need to provide additional therapy, and that's where continuous renal replacement therapy comes in. The advantages of continuous renal replacement uh, therapy include hemodynamic stability. What you don't see with CRRT are the large swings in blood pressure and volume status that you get with intermittent hemodialysis. So you avoid the hypotensive complications that you see during intermittent dialysis, and you avoid the large intravascular volume swings. Um, it's easy to regulate the fluid volume since the volume remo removal is continuous over 24 hours. Uh, you can adjust the rate of fluid removal on an hourly basis. So essentially, you look at the, uh, the critically ill patient's flow sheet, you look what their volume status is, you look over the last hour, last couple of hours, you see what their volume status is, and you can adjust your renal replacement therapy uh, to keep it in the uh, range that you need it to be. You can customize the replacement solution, so you can actually look at the patient's lab values and give back the electrolytes to maintain normal electrolyte ranges uh, based on the um, 
the hemo filtration solutions or the replacement solutions. And you don't need specialized dialysis nurses. Uh, most ICU nurses can set up a renal replacement circuit in about 30 to 45 minutes. The advantages of SLED, again, uh, you avoid the hypotensive complications that you see with intermittent dialysis, and you avoid the intravascular volume uh, changes uh, that can occur. You also get high solute clearance, so you can re remove a lot of solute, so in a sense you can really drop a BUN in a relatively short amount of time. But the nice thing about it is, as opposed to CVVH or uh, CVVHD, uh, which is continuous over 24 hours, you can actually have relatively flexible scheduling with SLED. You can schedule it for 12 to 18 hours a day. Uh, you can schedule it around the patient going to procedure, let's say in radiology, or the patient going to the operating room. Uh, you don't need the expensive uh, CRRT machines. You can use regular dialysis machines that you may have in your institution. Uh, you don't need the custom replacement solutions, although you can use them based on the patient's metabolic needs. Uh, and you don't need specialized support staff. Again, it can be run by uh, ICU nurses. The disadvantage of continuous renal replacement therapy is the lack of rapid fluid and solute removal. This is a, ra a, rap a rather slow process that occurs over 24 hours, or in the case of SLED, 18 to tw uh, 12 to 18 hours. Uh, and the effective GFR is in the range of about 5 to maybe 30 or 40 mils per minute, so you can't remove fluid and solute quickly. Uh, it has a very limited role in an overdose setting where you have to remove a toxin that's been ingested relatively quickly. CRRT is not going to work. There's some initial studies looking at SLED in the treatment of overdoses, but again, those are still in the uh, early phases of the investigation, and it's unclear whether SLED will be a therapy to be effective in the setting of overdose situations. And filter clotting. One of the things that happens as the filter um, is on a patient for two, three, four days or whatever, uh, you begin to have blood proteins clot on the filter, reducing the efficacy of the uh, dialysis circuit or the um, hemofiltration circuit. You could look at that and see the fact that you're not removing solute as quickly. Uh, we could tell that by, in the sense when I would be monitoring aminoglycosides in a critically ill patient, uh, let's say with a new filter, my genomycin clearance might be in the range of about 30 to 35 mils per minute. But as the filter got older and you had the deposition of uh, blood proteins on the filter, you basically would clot off some of the pores and you would see clearance decline over a couple of days from maybe the 30s to the mid-20s. Uh, and then depending if it lasted too long, the uh, clearance would drop down to the upper teens. And the basic principle, and I'll show you a graphic in a minute, is blood passes down one side of a highly permeable membrane. Water and solute pass across the membrane into uh, an ultrafiltrate uh, collection vessel. Uh, and solutes up to 20,000 Daltons. 20, Daltons can easily be removed via CRRT. Most drugs and electrolytes are within this range, so they're easily removable during this process. You can infuse replacement solutions with physiologic concentrations of electrolytes to keep the patient uh, relatively stable from a metabolic standpoint. And this is what a filter looks like from a, from a cartoon standpoint. The filter itself is probably the size of maybe one and a half to two times a paper, carton, uh, paper towel roll. So it's about maybe 12 inches long and about maybe three inches in diameter. And what you can see here on the right hand side of the screen is a cross section of what that filter looks like. So the hollow fiber membrane, the little red area, that's, those are the tubes that the blood comes down. And the fluid and solute passes across the, the red membrane uh, into the white area, which is the collection side inside of the canister. And then uh, it, it's eliminated out. So typically, if you look at this, the blood is coming in from the patient, typically from the femoral vein. Uh, there's a tube that goes to the blood import, and there's an arrow identifying it as the blood import that it then passes along these membranes to the blood outport. Uh, there's actually the, the, the fluid and solute basically uh, goes across the membrane and is eliminated into a, con a, a collection vessel hanging on the side of the bed. In the setting here, you see the blood import is at the top of the canister and, and the blood runs down the canister. If you look at the dialysis on the left hand side of the canister, uh, the dialysate solution comes in from the bottom, it goes counter current to the blood flow, and it flows out the top of the canister uh, into a collection vessel also on the side of the bed. 
The basic principles of hemofiltration are it's based on convection or a pressure gradient. Just imagine a leaf blowing down the, the road um, by the, via the wind. That's how basically the uh, solute passes through um, hemofiltration. It's based on the transmembrane uh, pressure gradient, so that's the difference between the plasma oncotic pressure or the pressure generated by the blood proteins trying to keep fluid inside the vascular space and the hydrostatic pressure or the, sta or the pressure pushing uh, solute outside the, intravas uh, outside the intravascular space um, into the canister collection side. Dialysis is diffusion based on a concentration gradient, so again the solute goes from a high concentration down to a low concentration trying to achieve an equilibrium. And this would be a typical CVVH circuit or a continuous venovenous hemofiltration circuit. And again, if you look at the canister, you see blood is coming in from the patient. Again, typically the uh, femoral vein, it flows into the top of the canister. Uh, it flows through the canister and fluid and solute goes across the membrane into the yellow side. Uh, and it, it basically it flows out to a collection vessel on the side of the bed. CVVH is based on convection, so it goes from an area of high pressure to low pressure, and again, it's that transmembrane pressure gradient, which drives the uh, solute removal. And also on the, on the right-hand side, you can see the replacement solution. The replacement solution can be administered either on the blood from the patient side or the blood returning to the patient side. It all depends. If you put it on the side of the blood in from the patient, you actually dilute out that blood coming from the patient that lowers the transmembrane pressure and that allows easier flow of the solute uh, into the waste side of the uh, canister. If you have it on the blood to patient side, you're actually diluting that hemoconcentrated solute or, or blood now back to the patient so it's diluted out before it goes back to the patient. So depending on the needs of the patient and the efficacy of the hemofiltration circuit, you can have your replacement uh, solution and either on the inside or on the outside uh, based on the needs. The primary goal of CVVH is basically uh, fluid removal through convection, so, or solute removal based on convection. So the patient may not have, they may have a moderately high BUN. You want to remove that. They may have other electrolytes that may be a little bit abnormal and elevated. And so mainly with convection, you can normalize those, uh, those values. Also, primarily it's for the uh, management of intravascular volume. So in that patient who's fluid, fluid overloaded, they may have some degree of oliguria that you need to infuse a lot of fluids, but they don't have the urine opera to keep up with that. You're going to use CVVH to remove that excess fluid and whatever solute, solute you need to uh, remove. The typical blood flow rate ranges from 10 to 180 mils per minute, but a typical starting range is about 150 mils per minute. And the ultrafiltration rate range is between uh, 6 and 50 liters per 24 hours. A typical starting rate for the ultrafiltration uh, is about 300 mils per hour. It requires replacement solution to drive convection. So again, if you have it on the, in, on the blood inside of the canister, you dilute out the blood proteins and you readily enhance uh, the, uh, the movement of solute from the blood into the uh, collection vessel. And for just hemofiltration alone or CVVH alone, you don't require a dialysis solution. So you're able to manage the solute uh, with convection alone. What we have in this graph here, if you look at the y-axis, we have ultrafiltration flow rate. On the x-axis, we have transmembrane pressure. And you can see here that in the blue curve, we have a blood flow of 180 mils per minute. In the red curve, we have a blood flow of 100 mils per minute. And as you increase the transmembrane pressure, you actually see that you increase the uh, ultrafiltration rate. And as you increase the pressure at a transmembrane pressure of around 200 and 200 to 250 uh, millimeters of mercury, you begin to plateau. So you really can't increase your ultrafiltration rate anymore. But if you increase the blood flow, if you increase by another 80 mils per minute up to 180 mils per minute, uh, you now see you can increase your ultrafiltration rate dramatically, uh, going uh, at, again at about a pressure of about 225 or so, you begin to plateau. But at that pressure, you've gone from about 40 mils or 50 mils per minute up to about 80 mils per minute. So by just increasing the flow rate of the blood and delivering more blood to the canister, you can actually enhance your ultrafiltration rate. This is now adding a countercurrent dialysis. So now we have CVVH uh, DF or dialysate. 
And so we're, we're looking at solute removal, solute removal now based on convection and diffusion. So in this case, we maybe have an, a relatively high BUN. We may, may have other electrolytes uh, that are significantly abnormal, and you have to remove them relatively uh, effectively, and convection, convection alone may not suffice. So you add in countercurrent dialysis, and you can see here, uh, the right side is still the same, but now we have the dialysis solution going countercurrent to blood flow, where the blood is coming into the top of the canister and returning to the patient from the bottom of the canister. We actually have our countercurrent dialysis solution coming in from the bottom of the canister and flowing to the top, uh, and again out to a waste uh, collection vessel. The primary goal here is solute removal by diffusion and convection. And like I said a moment ago, where convection may not be sufficient to remove the solute quickly or to the degree, to the degree that's needed, we can actually add in uh, diffusion with dialysis. And again, of management of intravascular volume. So now it really gives us the luxury of both moving, removing fluid and solute to a greater the degree than hemofiltration alone. Again, the typical blood flow rates are about 150 mils per minute to start off. Uh, we're combining CVVH and CVVHD. Our ultrafiltration rate, again, starting rates about 300 mils per minute. And our initial dialysis flow rates would be about a liter per hour. So that would be a typical starting range for blood flow, for ultrafiltration and dialysis. And then we can basically adjust it based on how fast we're removing fluid and how fast we're removing solute to normalize, um, let's say, the solute and metabolic profile. SLED, the primary goal again, is just like this before, it's both solute uh, uh, removal by diffusion. So again, it's a form of dialysis, not just hemofiltration, uh, and the management of intravascular volume. And here are the initial flow rates. Typically, uh, blood flow and dialysis flow rates are in the range of about 100 to 300 mils per minute. Now, the pharmacokinetics of renal replacement therapy is similar to what you would see in intermittent hemodialysis. Now, it's important to understand uh, how effective extracorporeal clearance uh, is going to be. And you have to look at it in, in the sense of the total of all forms of clearance, whether it's renal, non-renal, uh, or whatever. And as a rule of thumb, that if the extracorporeal clearance, uh, its contribution is greater than 25 to 30 or 35 percent, you will effectively remove a drug or a solute like an electrolyte by the uh, extracorporeal uh, therapy. So in this case, um, the fraction of the ex extracorporeal clearance is a function of the extracorporeal clearance divided by the sum of extracorporeal clearance, residual renal clearance, and then non-renal clearance. And again, if the ratio is such that the extracorporeal clearance is greater than 25 to 35 percent, you will remove that drug uh, from a patient. It's not relevant for drugs with a high non-renal clearance, so drugs like morphine, labetalol, midazolam, and things like that that are effectively removed by the liver because of blood flow to the liver, those drugs would not be expected to be removed by a CRRT circuit. And again, it's important to remember that only drug that's not bound to plasma proteins can be removed by extracorporeal um, procedures, so it's only the unbound fraction or the free fraction that's, that's removed. Now, it's important to remember in critical illness that albumin declines either because of reduced synthesis or loss to the extravascular compartment, that the protein binding of drugs that are bound to albumin may be changed and the free fraction may be elevated, and those drugs may be effectively removed uh, during CRRT. On the other hand, you have acute phase reactant proteins that bind to alpha-1 acyglycoprotein. That's elevated during critical illness, and those drugs to bind to uh, alpha-1 acyglycoprotein may be, um, may be enhanced, and the free fraction may be reduced, and you may not remove that, those drugs as effectively. The determinants of drug removal by CRRT, again, are the drug itself. Uh, it's the same as hemodialysis, but you do see an increase, we, uh, increase in the molecular weight of the drugs that can be removed. Typically, if you look at some of the old dialysis circuits, uh, vancomycin was not effectively removed. With some of the new circuits, uh, it is, and especially in CRRT, you can effectively remove vancomycin uh, during a dialysis session. Uh, the membrane, so the permeability, and we'll talk about the sieving coefficient in a couple of more slides. Uh, the size of the membrane, so again, the larger the membrane, the greater the surface area, the more ability to remove drug, and we'll talk about the sieving coefficient or the ability to, to cross uh, through the membrane. Uh, the renal replacement technique, so convention, uh, convection with or without dialysis will enhance um, drug removal. And the blood flow rates, 
uh, the blood flow to the filter, the dialysis flow rate through the canister, and then the ultrafiltration rate uh, where the effective fluid removal from the patient will all uh, define how well the drug will be removed and again the duration. The longer you hemofiltrate or dialyze somebody, the greater the amount of drug and solute that will be removed uh, over the time period. So the seeding coefficient is just the ability of the drug to pass through the hemofiltration filter and it ranges from zero to one. It's just the ratio of the concentration of the drug or the solute in the ultrafiltrate divided by the, by the concentration of the drug in the plasma. And for a drug that, uh, for a filter that's completely permeable to the drug or the solute, that the ratio uh, would give you a ratio or a seeding coefficient of one. If it's something that was to, uh, totally impermeable and could not pass through the filter, the ratio would be zero. Uh, such as a large blood protein or albumin, you would expect the seeding coefficient to be zero. So therefore, the hemofiltration clearance is just the flow, uh, the ultrafiltrate flow times the seeding coefficient, and that gives you hemofiltration uh, clearance. The determinants of the sieving, uh, sieving coefficient include protein binding, and again, uh, only unbound drug passes through the filter. And again, like I said a moment ago, protein binding changes in critical illness may alter the ability to uh, partition across the filter. Years ago, in the early 70s and late, uh, late 70s and early 80s, there was a number of studies looking at the ability of the drug to actually bind. To the, um, to the membrane, and there was a number of interaction studies that at the end of the day it was felt that this is relatively clinically irrelevant, uh, but again, it's something that can occur, but it's probably not anything that's gonna impact uh, drug removal. And the adsorption of proteins and blood products onto the filter, so again, it's related to the filter age. As the uh, filter gets older and you have more clotting on the filter, you see a decrease in the efficacy and the efficiency of solute removal. So if you're not re reducing, let's say, your BUN or your phosphate as fast, it may be an indication that the filter is clotting. And again, looking at aminoglycoside clearance as a proxy, you could see that uh, when the filter is new, you may be uh, eliminating the aminoglycosides quite easily, but as the, the filter ages, uh, you begin to see a reduced uh, clearance. Typically, filters are changed every three or four days. It's actually mandated now uh, that they really can't go as long as they used to be. I once saw a filter last seven days, uh, but again, that's been changed over time. Relating to the clotting of the filter, I've seen filters clot as quickly as within uh, 12 to 24 hours, and typically these filters have to be anticoagulated with a heparin type product or citrate type product to decrease the chances of clotting. This graph shows you the function of, or the relationship between unbound fraction and sieving coefficient. Where you have sieving coefficient on the y axis, you have unbound fraction on the x axis, and as you can see here, as you increase the unbound fraction, you increase the sieving coefficient. If you look up at the right-hand corner, you can see drugs like fluconazole, imipenem, procainamide, genomycin. The typical antibiotics one would use in an ICU all have uh, very high unbound fractions, very low degrees of protein binding, so they have relatively high uh, seeding coefficients and readily partition across uh, the circuit membrane. Dialysis saturation, this is just the countercurrent dialysis flow. Uh, is always less than, than blood flow. You can see here the ranges for dialysis flow is about 10 to 30 mils per minute for blood flow, typically in the range of about 1 to 200 mils per minute. And this really describes the equilibrium between the solute in the blood and the dialysate. And think about it as you're at the metro station and people are standing on the platform and the metro cars pull up, the doors open, people walk onto the cars, everybody has a seat, the doors close and the train pulls out and everybody's on a seat so it's 100% um, saturated with people so to speak. And so diffusive clearance or dialysis clearance basically equals to the train flow rate and essentially um, it will be that way. Now this dialysis saturation is just again the, the concentration of the drug in the dialysate divided by the concentration of the drug in the plasma and again your ratio uh, will vary depending on the kind of molecule you're talking about. Now things will impact the dialysis uh, saturation. Increasing molecular size, so the heavier the weight of the molecule, the slower it takes to transport, be transported across the membrane into the dialysis solution. So large molecules partition relatively slowly, small molecules partition relatively rapidly. 
and increasing dialysis flow rate. The faster the flow rate, the less time there is for equilibrium. So going back to the metro analysis, where everybody is standing on the platform, the train cars come up, the door is open, people start to uh, walk from the platform into the cars, and all of a sudden the door is closed and the train takes off. And again, it's not, all the seats aren't filled at this time, but the train is going so fast, it's standing for a lot less time at the station that it can't be filled to capacity. So again, it becomes less effective at higher dialysis flow rates. Dialysis clearance, and again, is basically the dialysis flow rate times the uh, dialysis uh, saturation. And this just shows you here, here we have a graph looking at clearance on the y-axis, and we have various dialysis flow rates um, on the x-axis. So we have flow rates of 1,000, 2,000, and 2,500 mils per hour. And we have compounds such as urea, vitamin B12, and inulin. And as you can see here, as you increase from dialysis flow rates of 1,000 mils per hour, you can see the clearance rates. And as you go up to 2,000 and then 2,500 mils per hour, you increase the clearance of each of these three substrates. So increase in dialysis flow rate from 1,000 to 2,500, or about two and a half times, you've almost doubled the uh, hemofiltration clearance uh, hemofiltration dialysis clearance of these compounds. So again, um, by just increasing the dialysis flow, you can increase the clearance, but again, you, have, you begin to have a tailing off in its efficacy the faster you go. So then in sum total then, extracorporeal clearance here with CRRT is basically the summation of the hemofiltration clearance, which is just uh, hemofiltra hemofiltration flow times seeding coefficient, plus the hemodialysis clearance, which is the dialysis flow rate times the dialysis saturation rate, and that would give us our total extracorporeal clearance. So here's a case history. Now this is the patient I actually was involved in here at the NIH Clinical Center a number of years ago. And this is a 36-year-old Hispanic male who was status post a bone marrow transplant for aplastic anemia. Uh, he was admitted to the ICU for management of his acute renal failure. Uh, we started him on CVVHD, so hemofiltration plus dialysis for the management of his uremia. His ICU course was quite complicated by pulmonary failure, uh, requiring mechanical ventilation. He had liver failure secondary to graft versus host disease, venoclusis disease, and he also had sepsis. His infection was managed by uh, genomycin and vancomycin, and his initial doses were genomycin 180 milligrams every 24 hours and vancomycin a gram every 24 hours. And his initial dialysis flow rate uh, was 1,000 mils per hour. And with that, his 12-hour post genomycin level and vancomycin levels were 3 to 4 and 20 to 23 milligrams per liter, respectively. And he was stable at this regimen, at this dialysis rate, uh, for about three or four days. His uremia worsened, so we increased his dialysis flow rate by 20% uh, up to 1,200 mils per hour. And then after that, our dialysis or 12-hour post genomycin and vancomycin levels dropped dramatically to less than 0.4 and less than 4 milligrams per liter, respectively. Uh, these were validated, and in fact, at this dialysis flow rate, these numbers were consistent uh, over two days. We subsequently increased his doses to maintain therapeutic levels, but here's an example how a slight increase in the dialysis flow rate had a dramatic effect on his antibiotic levels during therapy. So the question common, commonly comes up is, like, does a drug have to be, uh, or will it be removed during either CRRT or SLED? So how can I determine a priori uh, if I have a patient come in at 3 o'clock in the morning, where do I go to look and what, what can I look at just to see if a drug could be removed by CRRT or SLED? Well, there's three parameters you can look at and it will tell you essentially uh, how susceptible a drug is to removal. The first is if the protein binding is less than 70 or 80 percent, there's a good chance the drug will be removed. If the volume distribution is less than a liter per kilo, it would be removed. So again, if it, look, typically antibiotics are in the range of about 0.3 to 0.4, maybe 0.5 uh, liters per kilo. So again, they will be effectively removed. And if the renal clearance is greater than 35%, then those drugs will be removed. Well, what drugs fall into this category? Well, most of the antibiotics we administer to critically ill patients are going to fall into a protein binding less than 70%, a VD less than a liter per kilo, and a renal clearance greater than 35%. So it kind of tells you that those antibiotics will be removed. Well, that's great. How often should I administer the drug now? Well, if you're just doing hemofiltration alone, typically across most circuits, 
the effective GFR or glomerular filtration rate will range from about 10 to 20, maybe 30 mils per minute for a hemofiltration circuit alone. If you add in dialysis, the GFR may be in the range of about 20 to 50 mils per minute. And if you have SLED, the effective GFR is about 10 to 50 mils per minute. So knowing that your drug may be removed, typically an antibiotic may be removed, and knowing what kind of circuit you have, hemofiltration, hemofiltration with dialysis uh, or SLED, you can look into the package insert or the PDR or whatever reference you have and adjust the dose typically in the range of about 20 to 50 mils per minute. Uh, for your circuit. So that would give you a great starting dose from that standpoint. So what other kind of dosing adjustments do I need to do? Well, from a loading dose, when you want to get the serum concentrations therapeutic, there's no need to adjust the loading dose and somebody on some form of continuous renal replacement or SLED. Um, the loading dose depends typically on the volume and distribution, and if you know that for your critically ill population, you can give them a typical loading dose. For maintenance doses, you can use standard reference tables. So again, depending on the type of circuit you have and knowing what the effective GFR is, you can go to the PDR, you can go to a package insert, you can go to the formulary service and adjust the dose based on that. You can do it based on the measurement of losses or blood levels. So again, if you're monitoring drugs such as aminoglycosides or vancomycins or other drugs that you can monitor via drug levels, you can adjust based on what your drug level is now and where you want to be with your replacement dose or you can calculate the maintenance dose multiplication factor, the MDMF. So this is typically what we would have used with aminoglycosides or vancomycin. Uh, you know what your target concentration is. So let's say for aminoglycosides, using conventional dose and it's 12, you know what your measured dose is, let's say it's two. You need to increase the serum concentration by 10 milligrams per uh, uh, liter. Then you know what the, volume distribu what the volume distribution is. You can calculate the dose you need to give as a supplemental dose, and you can administer that to the patient. The other thing you can do is the, multiple, the maintenance dose multiplication factor. So if you know your extracorporeal clearance, let's say measuring uh, how much drug is coming out in the ultrafiltrate, knowing what you have through residual renal function. So if you're collecting urine and you measure the drug in that, if there any, is any urine, and then, if appropriate, you can look at non-renal clearance, typically from the literature, and you can calculate your MDMF uh, using these parameters. So what we're looking at here is that, looking at the MDMF for intermittent hemodialysis and CRRT, that for a drug, let's say like ceftazidime, um, and the, looking at clearance and non-renal clearance with, with a, a clearance of about 11 mils per minute, a typical dose uh, with somebody with a GFR of about 11 or a clearance of 11 mils per minute, you might give them a gram uh, once a day or every 24 hours. If they're on intermittent hemodialysis, you would give them 1.6 times that dose. So you would give them 1.6 or 1.5 grams every 24 hours. And because continuous renal replacement is much more effective, you would give them 2.2 times that dose or roughly 2 to 2.2 grams every 24 hours. Um, something like vancomycin, um, you, you might give them with a clearance of six mils per minute, you might give them a gram once a day or so, once every couple of days, that looking at the MDMF for intermittent hemodialysis, you might give them 3.9 times that, or roughly 3.9 grams or four grams every couple of days. For CRRT, it would be 4.9 times that. So again, you would adjust the dose accordingly. And something like with vancomycin, you would give them a dose, but you would monitor the levels and adjust accordingly to give you your trough uh, levels that are clinically relevant for that patient. The same thing by SLED and CRRT, again, looking at linazolid for a clearance of about 76 mils per minute. If the patient was on SLED, uh, instead of giving them 600 mils, milligrams a day, you might give them 660 or maybe rounding that up or so to 700 milligrams a day. If they were on CRRT, you would give them basically 840 or maybe 900 milligrams uh, once a day based on uh, the appropriate, appropriate amount of uh, drug uh, based on its removal characteristics. Something like imipenem, where you might give them a 500 milligrams, or, or sorry, miropenem, 500 milligrams once a day with a clearance of 21 mils per minute. You might give them uh, 800 milligrams at, at that same interval. If they were on SLED or if they were on CRRT, uh, you might give them maybe a gram uh, to round it up uh, from that standpoint. So in summary, CRRT is a common uh, continuous dialysis uh, therapy that's used in critically ill patients, primarily for excess fluid removal and excess solute removal, typically in patients who are anuric or oliguric. 
that have a requirement for fluid administration, typically through antibiotics or vasopressors or nutrition solution, and have a need for fluid uh, removal. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you found it informative. Uh, if you have any questions, please forward them to the uh, program administrator. He'll forward them on to me, and I'll be happy to answer questions for, uh, for you uh, through him. Thank you for your time.